So when I was about seven years old, I woke up one morning before school and ran out to see my bunnies and feed them before I left for school. Through the snow, through the cold, I uh, got to their cage and hair was everywhere and it looked like a dog had gotten in there or something. Everything was just a mess. And I frantically looked through all the hair, found bunnies, but also found all these baby bunnies. They were brother and sister, these two bunnies that I had in this one cage. I didn't think they could have babies, but there was five frozen babies, frozen solid. I, I scooped them up and put them in my shirt and ran to my kitchen. I'm like, dad, 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 help me. They're frozen. Something's wrong, something's wrong, I need help. And in my mind, like this was the worst moment I'd ever experienced in my entire life. So my dad, desperately looking in my eyes, knowing that I needed an answer right then and I needed some hope, grabbed this bowl, put some warm water in it, put their little baby bodies, frozen bodies in this water and tried to bring them back to life. And he looked down at me again and I'm like, dad, help them. And so he, bless his little heart, grabbed each one and did mouth to mouth and then tapped on their little, did a little CPR on each one of them, just tapping on their belly and then breathing in their mouth. And it seems so funny now, but I have to tell you, in that moment, those bunnies came alive, first of all. But I knew my dad loved me. I knew that I was going to be okay. It was a glimmer of light and these bunnies, I think they only lasted a few days after that. Like they were not okay. But I was okay because my dad made the effort to show me that I was worth breathing through the mouths of baby bunnies to reassure and to give the glimmer of light. So I thought about that story the other night and and thought about each one of you. I don't get to see your faces right now. I really wish I could see your faces. Um, but I thought about each one of you and the moments in your life when you've been stuck in the dark. Maybe right now this being at home and quarantine and all the things we're dealing with in our world and people dying and the economy struggling, all of these things are so hard. It can feel pretty dark some days. But I want to reflect upon some of my darkest days and also challenge you to do the same. You've been through dark days before. What were those glimmers of light? What made the difference between living in the dark and being able to forge through it to get to the light? Because that's what we have to do. That's what we're going to have to do now. And it's what we're going to have to do later. I need to make sure that we... It's what we're going to have to do later. When, when we are bombarded by darkness, it is so hard to find hope. So fast forward many, many, many years, I, I survived many things. I went through a divorce, my parents got divorced. Um, I kind of bounced around a little bit to different schools, all things that some days were kind of hard. But I also um, remember starting college thinking, you know what, this is going to be the best years of my life. And so I began on a journey through college, meeting lots of different people and eventually finding the man that I decided to marry. And we had quite the life. It wasn't glorious with two parents in school, but we were blessed with twins and then a little boy two years later and then a few miscarriages and a little girl. And then my husband was finishing up law school and he decided that we were gonna move to Meridian, Idaho where he could do his externship and work and he had all these opportunities awaiting him. And not long after we moved in, the economy was low, we had this amazing house. I remember looking around my house like, I'm living my dreams. And in the back of my mind, I think I, I had this belief like, well, I deserve to live my dreams. I've been a good girl. I tried to do everything I knew I was supposed to do. I've never done drugs, I've never drank. I. When I got married, I'd never done anything with a man. Like everything that I've been asked to do to be a good girl, I've done it. So look how great I am. Look at these amazing blessings that I've received because I deserve them. 
And that moment, I wish I could go back to that girl and be like, whoa, um, but I can't. But from about that point on, some things started feeling weird around me. Um, I, I got pregnant with our fifth and turned out to be a boy. And all through this pregnancy, I felt this strange feeling constantly, like I was being watched, like things were weird and I was getting shaky. I'd even go to my doctor. I'm like, I think something's wrong. Like maybe I have postpartum depression. He was like, oh, postpartum means after you have a baby, like you're pregnant. So I, you say you're still like the happiest person I know. So you're good. And I was like, no, something, something's wrong. And I spent months thinking I was crazy. Um, I spent months wishing so bad that I had an answer because I'm a woman. So obviously I could have fixed whatever it was. So towards, um, when the baby was going to be born, I started doing what most crazy people do. I started looking through my husband's stuff, which was really uncharacteristic of me. Unless I got a feeling that something was wrong throughout our marriage. I was like, I love you. I trust you. Um, I didn't ever remember going through his stuff, but I started going through his stuff. Like when he was in the shower, I'd run out to his car and try to like, is there a clue to what the crap is happening so I can fix it? And I even tried to get in his phone. I never could get in his phone, but I remember going to the hospital to have the baby Titus. His name was Titus is Titus, but to have Titus and feeling so alone. I was like, I, you are not connecting with me at all. What? What is going on? And everything that I thought I had deserved felt like it was crashing down, but I had no reason to feel like that. So I had the baby and it was gone a lot during this time. He would run to his office, which was really close to the hospital, which really wasn't a big deal, but it was not like he'd done with other babies. Um, we got home and that feeling became so overwhelming that I literally was shaking all the time. I would, I would feed the baby. I would do everything I needed to do. I'd get the twins to school. They were in kindergarten, but I felt like something was wrong with me. And so about five weeks after he was born, I made an appointment with a marriage counselor, which Emma didn't show up to, but I went and I was like, here's the thing, something's wrong. And, and maybe it's that my parents got divorced when I was little. I don't know what it is, but I need you to fix me because I'm like losing my mind. I'm not like normal crazy person level. I'm like crazy person. I don't know what's wrong. And I, I talked to this counselor for hours. Well, it was an hour. You get, you get done. And I, I wanted to talk to him for hours. And he, by the end, he was like, Ashley, it, it feels like something maybe really is wrong. Maybe next week, bring your husband in with you. And let's do another appointment and let's figure out together so maybe you guys can get some help. And I was like, I don't think it's our marriage. Like we've always had an amazing marriage. He's an amazing father. At least he was. He's just really busy right now. But I want to support him. And I want, I want us to be back where we were. I just don't know what to do to fix it. So he's like, okay, just bring him in. And I stopped at a, a church leader's house on the way home. Same thing. He was like, okay, I, I really want to help you. Why don't you bring him in next week? And we'll we'll talk with him and see see if we can figure out what's going on so so you so you can fix it. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna be okay. A little glimmer of light. Next week, everything's gonna be okay. We're gonna sit down with these two men, and if something's going on with Emmett, he's gonna tell me, and I'm gonna fix it, and I'm gonna love him, and we're gonna be okay, and everything's gonna be fine. This is gonna be perfect. So next week came. And Emmett had, he was leading on a trip during that time. He came back from his trip and um, nothing seemed better. I told him about these appointments and he's like, maybe, yeah, sure. He seemed more and more distant every single day. And there had been nights where he was gone and he wouldn't come back to like one in the morning, just weird stuff that wasn't him. And I remember waking up, it was March 11th of 2011. And I woke up that morning with that determination of that little girl who wanted to fix those buddies. And I was like, you know what? Okay, today I am going to, I'm gonna to go to Target and buy laundry baskets. I don't, I don't know why I always remember this. 
crazy people who don't know what to do do crazy stuff and that was mine that day i spent like 200 dollars on laundry baskets each kid had like nice laundry baskets i'm not sure why still but then i got home and i was like i'm gonna cook all his favorite food i'm gonna send him pictures of the kids everything today will be perfect and i am going to be in charge and he's going to come home and we're going to talk about whatever it is that's been going on whether it's outside of this home or inside of this home i want to be what he wants and i'll change anything to be what he wants so he will come home more so he'll spend more time with his kids i need to change maybe it's me and whatever it is we're gonna fix it and he came home that night like two hours later than I'd planned. The kids were tired, the food was cold, and I saw no glimmer of light, but I kept pushing with that determination to be able to figure out what was going on. And the night progressed, and soon I was on the phone with a friend who had just talked to him on the phone, and I was in the back room. Um, this guy was a counselor, and I was begging him to listen, and he had already heard what Emmett's side was of things, which I'd heard through the monitor, which none of it was true, which made me feel even more alone and more suffocated and more in the dark. And as I was talking to this guy on the chair, and it walked in and he's like, okay, I'm gonna go run to Walgreens. I will be right back. And I got that, that pit in my stomach that I had for a while, that I'd been waiting for it to go away. And it, this overwhelming feeling, like do not let him go. And so I held the phone down. I'm like, no, Emmett, please, please, whatever is going on, we have to fix this. We have to fix this for our babies. We have to fix this for each other. I don't even know what's going on, but I need you to stay here. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? Don't tell me what to do. I'm going to go. And I remember staring at him as he walked out the door. And as I heard the garage door slam, and my baby started screaming. I got off the phone. I grabbed this little baby. He was almost seven weeks old. And I just bounced. And I promised that baby so many things. Us moms think we're so invincible, I guess. Um, I promised that baby that everything was going to be okay. That baby that had cried so many times when his dad had left like that. I promised him that everything was going to be okay, that we were going to be just fine, that we were going, everything was going to be fine. And I, I was going to fix this. And I would grab this marriage self-help book that I bought after going to the counselor. And I was reading it and I was bouncing this little baby. And every few minutes I'd go to reach for my phone and I'm like, you know what? I don't think I have it in me to have anybody tell me I'm crazy anymore. I've been reaching out to people saying something's wrong. Nobody's listening. I text my family. They don't, they're like, Wait, what's going on? What, if something's wrong, what is it? And I, I'm crazy. Like I'm literally losing my mind. And so I put my phone back down and I just bounce and promise and cry and pray and tell this baby that everything's going to be okay. And pretty soon I got that. Oh my gosh, something's really wrong. Something's really wrong. And I grabbed my phone and I, for the first time that night, I called Emmett's phone and I was shaking. I'm like, just answer, just answer, just answer nothing. So I text him a few times like, is everything okay? Something feels really wrong. Nothing. So we kept bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And pretty soon that baby fell asleep. And I was like, oh my gosh, all the other kids are asleep. Now you're asleep. And I looked around my giant empty house, wishing so bad to have nothing and to be in college and just be a simple little family that loved each other, wishing all the stuff would disappear and I could just go back to before it when I felt the love that I wanted so bad that night. And I remember praying so hard for just one answer, just one like tip on what I could fix to make him want me, to make him want to come home to us every night and spend time with us. One answer, that's all I wanted. And pretty soon I fell asleep and I was woken up to this pounding on my front door. And I remember walking to my front door, like, what if this is my answer? He got in a wreck, he's in a hospital bed, I'm gonna go there and he's gonna see me and he's gonna want me to help him because he's gonna need me. He doesn't need me now, he has money and he has his work friends and he has 
clients and he doesn't even know I exist anymore, but he's going to in this moment. So I walked to the door and I opened it and there were there's just these three strangers I'd never seen before. They were just in street clothes and one held something up. I didn't even give a crap. He held it up and said he needed to come in. I'm like, no, you can't come in my house. It's just me and my babies. Just anything you need to say, just say it to me right here. And they just kept looking around and I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what are you looking at? And pretty soon my sister ended up pulling up and she walked in the house with me and these three strangers. And I sat on my black leather couch that Emmett and I had picked out it was the perfect couch. And I sat on this couch across from these people who gave me way more than one answer that night. Um, they gave me a lot of things that I never knew were possible, but they did, they did um, tell me what was wrong. That night Emmett had been shot and killed in a Walgreens parking lot by two bullets, once in the forehead and once in the heart. That was the truth. One answer. They gave me um, a lot of information about his struggles. Um, he had been having an affair with a paralegal that worked for us at the law office. And her husband had come to the Walgreens, found them together, and he was the one with the gun in his hoodie pocket. Um, they told me that the husband did know about the affair, that there was a letter in his car addressed to me that he was going to mail. It even had a stamp on it, I believe. And it told me about all of the affair and everything. They gave me lots of information about my new reality. They, they, uh, they told me everything. I don't remember everything they even told me. I just remember feeling like I couldn't breathe. Like they just placed this weight set on my chest and I like couldn't breathe like this. Every, every question I answered, I was like, don't, uh, uh, it, I, like literally even when I talk about it, I can't breathe. Um, it just felt like I was on a movie. It felt like I was a joke. It felt like I was the most worthless person in the entire world. And what I know now that I didn't then is they didn't just give me words and facts. They opened me up to so much darkness all at once um, that I also took on a bunch of beliefs and lies about who I thought everybody thought I was. And you guys know that like voice in your head? I call it the dude in your head. Mine sounds like a dude, ironically so do I. You're, if you're a woman, yours might sound like a girl. But what happens to us in these traumatic moments where we feel like we're sitting in a hole and going, my life is never going to be the same. And your traumatic moment is gonna look so different than mine. I hope none of you know this traumatic moment that I had. Your traumatic moment might have been, you know what, this guy I thought I was gonna marry, all of a sudden he dropped off the face of the earth and he never responded to me, he never called me. Whatever your traumatic, no one can judge what your traumatic moment is. But if you've had a moment where you've sat in a black hole by yourself, even if you were surrounded by a million people, and you thought, you know what, my life is never going to be the same as it is right now, then you've had a traumatic moment. And what happens in those, at least what's happened in mine and a lot of other people I've talked to, you don't just take on the words and the truth and the facts and all of those things. You are like open up to the darkness of the entire world. And he goes, oh my gosh, yes. Pathetic loser, I remember you. Okay, so let's go back to all of the things that make you a pathetic loser. And this is just more evidence for you to stop living as if you're gonna succeed at anything, as if you're going to accomplish anything, as if you're even worth anything. And he drags you through every traumatic situation, whether for me it was one moment in a bathroom when I heard one of my neighbor friends that I thought was my best friend tell her friend like, oh, the only reason I invited Ashley to my birthday was because my mom made me. Moments where you're like, oh my gosh, what is real? I was in first grade and I heard my friend say this. So anyways, you get dragged back through all these traumas. If you're sitting in a funeral, sometimes you're going back through every funeral you've ever been to, every loss you've ever felt, because that's what he wants you to feel. He wants you to feel broken 
and alone and afraid and worthless and like you're never going to amount to anything. And this moment, this thing happened to you that makes you an idiot, that makes you stupid, that makes you fat. You are fat. Look at you just had a baby and you are this and this and this and this and this. And all the lies that had ever triggered in my mind just had a baby and they exploded. And I walked around for years believing them. Like I was some worthless piece of crap because of choices that three people made, regardless of who I was. But in that moment, I'm like, oh wow, okay. So I wasn't enough for my own husband. I wasn't enough for a man with a gun who I've never met. I've only heard his name like twice, maybe. I wasn't enough for the other woman who's met me, who's held my baby, who sent presents home to me. I wasn't enough for her to just stay with her own husband. I wasn't enough for anybody. I wasn't even, my own husband died fighting for another woman. And that's where it was. I was like surrounded by all these facts that were going to someday be in a murder trial, but facts in my own mind of why I was worthless and why I wasn't enough and why I was never going to be lovable, smart, beautiful, any of it. I was never going to be anything again. And that was my trauma. I want you guys to know Things are going to happen in your life that make you question who you are. Maybe some, something that's happened in your life has been all over the news and you've been humiliated and you felt so alone and afraid, but it wasn't the thing that happens to us that ends up defining who we become because of it. It's our willingness to take those lies and start to live them. So here's what I propose. This is an assignment for all of you. This is what I did that finally made me realize I, I spent hundreds and thousands of dollars on counseling and vitamins and all these things that really were helping in all these different ways. But until I went back to the moment, the moments, every traumatic situation that I get triggered back to of worthlessness, of feeling alone, that grew that night a hundred times, when you go back to those moments, you get a different view. You get a different view of who you were. So what I thought in those moments that I was broken and a loser and humiliated and afraid and how was I going to protect my family and all of these fears and chaos. And when I went back to them and I started writing them down, you are not enough. You are not enough. It just kept going on and on in my head and I let myself feel it. And I went back to those moments and I felt the pain that I had lived and that I had carried and that I had believed and I had allowed to lead my life. And I wrote them down and I called them out and I said, you know what? I pray to my heavenly father, pray to whoever you, you believe is your higher power. Pray. Is this true? Am I really every broken thing that I think that I am? And ask on each line, Heavenly Father, am I really not enough? Because I wasn't enough for that gun. I wasn't enough for that man or that woman or my own husband who died fighting for another woman. Am I enough for you? The answer is yes. And I went through each one. There were about 15 pages of them. And each one, instead of living those lies, I started crossing out the ones that he told me were not true. And then I prayed again and I'm like, okay, if I'm enough for you and you want me to be enough for me, then what are the truths that I'm forgetting? What, what do you see in me that I don't or haven't seen in years? And I made a new list. All these were crossed out. I made a new list. And there were things like, you are enough for me. You are smart. You are brave. You are kind. Look back at that girl. Look how brave she is. She wasn't broken. When she walked into her closet and she got on her knees and she begged for a do-over, she was being brave because she didn't know what she was going to do. She kneeled on her knees to beg for help because she knew she felt small and broken. And you guys, that night when I did go and kneel down in my closet and I pleaded Heavenly Father, please, I just need one do-over. I just need you to do today differently. I need you to rewind. I need you to please, please, I've done so many things right. Please, please, please. That answer was not given to me. I sat in my closet in the silence for a while. And pretty soon I felt those truths. 
it was hard as I walked out of my closet to remember him, but he, he promised me things like I was going to get through this. I was going to be strong. I was going to forgive. I was going to accomplish. I was going to still be the mother I'd always been. I had the capability to love. All these truths filled my closet. And as I walked out into a house full of chaos again with detectives and people coming in and out, it was harder to remember, but that little glimmer of light that my father knew where I was, that he had a plan for me, that he had faith in me. I sometimes had to look back to that moment a lot because when you're surrounded by so much darkness, it is so hard to see those glimmers of light, glimmer, glimmers of light, but we can hang on to them. We can know that he is there. We can know that we are enough for him. And I promise wherever you've been or whatever you're doing, he knows where you are. He knows what you've been through. And he believes in you. He believes in us through everything we have to go through. He believes in us through everything we do wrong. He still sees our worth. And what a gift. You know, in a, in a perfect world, these things wouldn't happen to any of us. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have people we love die, lose their lives fighting for another woman. But I feel blessed to be where I am today. And I know that because of that glimmer of light in my closet, I made it through many other hard moments. I made it through, <laughs> I uh, had another glimmer of light one day when um, my cousin was there for the summer to help me with the kids and we decided to drive up for Memorial Day to decorate Emmett's grave. And um, I was really nervous about going to his grave. I hadn't been there since the burial when my kids had pounded on his casket and were mad at me for not opening it and all these traumatic things that had happened there. And I remember driving there like, okay, I, I can do this. I can do this. And just feeling so small and feeling my worth just wash away with each breath. And we got to the hotel and Tiffany was putting kids to bed and I was putting kids to bed. And I was like, oh my gosh, Tiffany, I forgot to buy all this stuff. We were going to leave early in the morning. I've got to run over to Walmart and grab some stuff to decorate the grave. So she's like, okay, I'll finish putting the kids to bed. You run across the street, go to Walmart. So I, um, I get to Walmart and... I am standing in front of, it was Memorial Day, so right when you walk in, there was just tons of wreaths and grave decorations and feeling so much anxiety. And I just stood there like, I'm not doing this. I'm not gonna pick out any one of these freaking wreaths, first of all, because if I touch one, that means I'm okay with this new life that I've been given. And that means I'm okay with everything that's happened and I'm not. And I stood there, little stubborn girl, and I just stared at him like, I don't know, like, was he my husband? <laughs> he didn't show me anything about being a husband towards the end. And I was so mad. I just stared at him. Okay, well, maybe that, nope. And I stood there. I don't even know how long I was standing there. And all of a sudden, this younger guy, I think he was younger, I don't even know his age, came over in my fog he taps on my shoulder and he was like, hey. And I literally didn't even know there was other people in the store. I was like, hey, what, what, are, what are you doing? And I seriously was like, oh, who even is talking to me? And I look over and he's like, hey, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? You've, just, you've literally been standing there for like ever. And I could not step out of my fog. I just kept like, um, so I, um, I'm just standing here. I have to pick out stuff to decorate, to decorate my husband's grave, actually. Um, yeah, he was like, wait, are you, are you serious? I'm like, no, yeah, I'm serious. And um, he goes, um, okay, so can I ask some questions? I'm like, sure, dude, whatever. And he goes, well, like, how did he, how did he die? He seemed really young. And I was like, oh, oh, we're gonna go there, okay. And I just spewed it all. I like told the whole story. And he literally was sitting there, like he just watched an episode of Dateline. And he goes, um, 
are you being serious? I'm like, no, no, yeah, I'm really being serious. And he's like, oh, oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, and those, those five kids, they're, they're mine and he, he's dead. And he, and I just, I don't even know what all I said to him. And he was just like, okay, um, good luck. And he walks away and like, okay, that was easy enough. I guess I can repel men just by speaking. That's perfect. Um, and he walked back to back over and he's like, okay, so here's the thing. I came over here really because I wanted to get your number. And I looked at him again out of my fog and I'm like, what the hell are you going to do with my number? And he's like, well, you seem like a really cool girl and you're really pretty. And I just, I just wanted your number. And I'm like, hmm. Okay, I gave him my number. This is this is real. And he walked away, and I grabbed a reef, went and paid, went and got in my car, set the reef in the back, was about to start the car, and I swear to you, I heard Emmett's voice. I know, normal crazy people stuff, right? And he goes, Ash, I just wanted you to know that you're beautiful. And all I needed was that glimmer of light. That random kid coming over and helping me know my worth in that moment. Help me grab a wreath and help me accomplish everything I needed to accomplish in the next few days. So in our stories, there are glimmers of light. I'm gonna tell you about um, a so when I was in, I think it was like my junior year of college, I was in some pretty heavy child development classes and there was a study conducted. I don't, I don't even know the details. I need to find out the details so I can actually quote it. But all I remember is they took identical twins and they were interviewing them to see what was nature versus nurture, nature versus nurture and what people were born with, what was in their DNA, blah, blah, blah. So they took all these different identical twins and asked them all these series of questions. And they got to this one particular set of twins and the man was, um, or one of the brothers was like a doctor and had four kids and a wife and white picket fence house and all of these things going for him. And the other brother was, had been in and, in and out of jail. He was a drug addict. He had all of these struggles all the time in his life and in his story. So they brought in the brother with all the struggles and they're like, okay, all these questions, blah, blah, blah. They get to the last question and they're like, hey, so why are you the way that you are? Like you're so different than your brother. What, why are you the way that you are? And he's like, man, my, my brother doesn't even know this, but when we were little, my mom used to beat me and lock me in the closet. And I knew right then and there that, that I was not worth anything, that she was right. I was never going to amount to anything. I was just worthless and I was never going to be anything. And they were like, oh man, yeah, no wonder. Sheesh. Okay. Next brother, they brought the other brother and asked him all the questions and got to that last question. Okay. So you are so different from your brother. We just talked with him. Why are you the way that you are? What makes you so different from your brother? And he was like, oh man. Okay, so no one knows this. My brother, I've never even told my brother this. But when we were little, my mom used to beat me and she used to lock me in the closet. And I knew right then and there that I was worth more than she was telling me I was. That I was going to make something of myself. That I was going to become something to prove her wrong. Okay, so two brothers. These are the two brothers. I, I'm sorry, I use my hands. My kids make fun of me. I need a microphone. That's my safe place. Um, two brothers. One had a story where his mom beat him and locked him in the closet. And the other had a story where the mom beat him and locked him in his closet. This one, kind of like me on that moment with my detectives on my couch. He went, okay, I am worth nothing. I will never amount to anything humiliated, alone, and dark. And this one said, oh, heck no. 
I am worth so much more than any single person in this house is telling me that I am. I'm worth more than my mom's beating. I'm worth more than being locked in a closet. And I choose me. I choose God and I choose me. And today I decide what I, my future is going to look like. The same story. So here's the thing. Your story looks like no one's. And you are going to find people who have similar things and you're going to want to ask advice to them and you're going to, you're going to want to reach out to people who have similar struggles. But really, it's, it's your journey and it's beautiful. And you get to decide what it's going to become. No matter how many people have been through the same thing, who have struggled, who have failed, it doesn't mean you're going to. You see, we each get to decide who we want to be. We get to decide if we believe the lies or if we, be, if we get to believe the truth. And I know without a doubt that lives can be changed, that we can find our worth, that we can find joy, that we can be blessed beyond measure, even when we've lost, that we can love. I know that I am worthy of love, regardless of if Emmett could show me it. Maybe he didn't think he was worthy of love. Maybe he had struggles that I didn't even know he had. Those were his issues. And the other two, those were their issues. I have decided to no longer carry anybody else's issues, but to be me. And I challenge you to do the same. There are so many stories in my story that brought little glimmers of light. And there are so many stories in your story that there has been a glimmer of light. I challenge you to go back today and find it. This quarantine, let's take this for example. This is hard. This is dark. And sometimes being the teacher and the cook and the cleaner and whatever other roles, whatever other hats you're having to take. I mean, hairdresser who, who has had to cut their own child's hair and never done it before. There's all these new things that we're being thrown into and it can feel really dark and really heavy. But what is good about it? I was on the phone with Ketchy. You guys are going to hear from her later on today. I was on the phone with Ketchy yesterday. And she always makes me cry, first of all. She is a rock star. But I was on the phone with her just about simple stuff about this stuff. Nothing big, okay? And we were talking about her sister. And I'm like, oh, isn't your sister a senior? And she's like, no, she's a junior. And I was like, man, I feel so bad for those seniors. And I feel bad for the ninth graders. My twins, they don't even get to finish out junior high. And here's what she said. I always learn from her. She was like, but Ash, let's not feel bad for those seniors. They're alive and they're healthy. Yeah, they're going to miss out on some things, but that's not just what life is about. And I was like, okay, mic dropped. End of, the, end of the conversation. And the way that we see our situations is the way that they can affect us. If we're constantly going, oh my gosh, if you guys could see what's behind my camera, my kids did not clean a darn thing before they ran out the door to go on a drive. So I could do this in the quiet. It's a mess. Everything in our lives sometimes feels like a mess. But there is so much good in our lives too. I have loved working in my yard and repainting my kitchen and doing fun things with my kids. And it was things that we would never have done had we not given this, been in this situation. So I challenge you right now to not only go back, but to live now. So what happens if we live in the past... Of, of the struggles we had in the past, we live in fear and chaos. If we live in the future of what could be or what, what could happen, we live in chaos and fear. But if we live right now, it's a lot easier to enjoy life. It's a lot easier to show up for the people that we want to show up for. It's a lot easier to be the person that we want to be. So that's your other challenge. How, this is the question, write it down. How can I show up today? For yourself, for your Heavenly Father, or your higher power, whatever you believe in? How can you show up for people who need you? And how can you show up for yourself? How can you show up for yourself today? Have you been taking care of yourself? Have you been getting exercise and eating healthy? Have you been letting yourself have a treat? Are you the opposite extreme? We all have addictions, right? And they go, I want you to picture any, any addictions, they go this way in your life, okay? They're pulling at you this way. Every time you're like, oh, I need to spend more time with my family. And it goes, oh, no, 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 I have to go to the gym. Whatever it is, okay? I want you to picture this. I'm gonna give you a visual. This looks kind of fun. 
Um, anytime you're trying to pull towards something and you get pulled the other way, let's, let's call that an addiction. Even though maybe you're not like a chain smoker or something. Okay. I want to eat healthy. No, I got to eat my chocolate and my bonbons, whatever. Okay. So visual, visualize with me for a minute. Our connections. Okay. Here's a, here's an example. Our connections have to be up. We're going to be connected to our higher power, something greater than ourselves upward. And we're going to be connected to this earth and our mission and our purpose. Okay, stomp if you have to. Like, I want to be on this earth, and I have a mission, and I have a purpose. And above me, I have a creator who believes in me, who loves me, who has truth that I came down to earth with that I just have to remember. But I'm so pulled all the time this way that I can't even remember what he's trying to say or hear anything that he's trying to say. And all he wants me to do is remember. He wants me to remember my worth. He wants me to remember everything. So picture yourself on days when you feel so pulled this way or this way. Or so overwhelmed with the mess of your house or the mess of your relationships, whatever it is. This is what we end up doing a lot of times when we're overwhelmed with a relationship, let's say. We turn to friends and they say, oh, you should do this. And we turn to somebody else and they say, oh, you should do this. And here we are stuck again, stuck, just pulled, pulled, pulled. Hey, you should work out more. Maybe your husband would like you more. You should... You should have a girl's night and eat whatever you want. Everything is this way. You should get divorced. You should stay married. Everything is pulled when we're always reaching out. Let's say I was even pulled this way when that guy said, oh, you're beautiful and I want your number, right? I was pulled. And all of a sudden I had confidence because he gave it to me. It wasn't because I got it this way or connected to my mission and my purpose. I connected to a person who gave me a spark who I went and was able to do, accomplish what I needed to do. Okay, so when you're being pulled this way and this way, it's really hard to know what Heavenly Father wants you to do on this earth when everybody is telling you where you need to be. Okay, so our challenge, our next challenge, I want you to write down what it would look like if you got your inspiration and you actually followed through with what you were feeling that you should do. Not what your mom tells you you should do, not, not the, the job that your dad thinks that you should do and call it, go through college to become this. What does God want you to do? Where does he want you to be? What relationships does he want you to hold on to? And which ones does he want you to let go? That was something I had to do. I ended up getting remarried after you guys. I feel like I have so much I want to say and I need to not take so much time. But I ended up getting remarried and ended up six years after my remarriage in a spot where I knew what God wanted me to do and I was so freaked out to do it because it meant failure again. I had prayed and prayed and prayed for months and I had the do over, it just came six years later, with a new person and I stood at a crossroads going, if I leave, then everything that I said I would have done, I would have stayed with him, I would have loved him through it, I would have, even if he told me he was having an affair, we would have figured it out, we would have stayed together that's what I had made up my mind would have been if I had my do-over. And then I got a different version of a do-over with a person that I had given my heart to and I loved. And I, I loved the little girl that came into our lives. And I stood at this crossroad knowing the Heavenly Father wanted me to leave. And the night that I knew I had to leave, the inspiration I got, not from my mom and not from a friend, was... You are worth more than you have been shown you, than you have been shown, than you have been given. You have the gift to love and you need to, you need to find someone who's going to allow you to give that gift without all the addictions and chaos and pain. And I need you to go. And it was one of the scariest, the most scary decisions I have ever made in my life. And I had been one of those girls that thought, you know what? Even when my parents got divorced, I remember the belief in my mind was they just gave up. They didn't, they didn't try. Little did I know that my mom had the exact same experience as me where Heavenly Father said, you know what? It's time. It's time to go. And I've learned so much through that whole experience. But even more than anything, I've learned that I have to be connected to my Heavenly Father. I have to be connected to the truth that He wants me to live. And failing isn't always walking away. And succeeding isn't always staying. And that's okay. 
I didn't learn that the hard way. But I also realized that whether or not I got a do-over with Emmett, I got a do-over for me. I got to choose that I am worth more than than people sometimes tell us we are. So if you have a, a place, maybe you're the one getting locked in your closet. Maybe you have been pleading and pleading to find your worth and you just keep getting locked in the closet. I want you to know you don't have to get your worth from the person locking you in your closet. You don't have to get your worth from the boy telling you you're cute at the grocery store. You don't have to get your worth from your kids' teachers telling you that they do a good job because they're not always going to do a good job. The moment the phone rings and they say, oh, you know what? Your kid's been a little a-hole this week. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I need you to know that this and this and this. You don't have to take on little, little sass holes problems. You don't have to take on anybody else's stuff. Your story has been hard. There are people that you're still hanging on to, that you have a hard time forgiving, that you don't want to let go because the pain they cause you, you've thrown this victim badge on your chest and you're like, you know what? No, I'm going to be angry. I'm just going to be angry. You guys, I've been there. And guess what? So I have a quote for you. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and realize that the prisoner was you. I'm going to say it one more time. This is by Lewis. Means, I believe. It's my favorite quote. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and realize that the prisoner was you. We have to forgive. To physically be able to function and breathe, I had to learn to forgive. I had to learn to let go every time I was triggered, which happened at the drop of a hat for a long time. Anytime the doorbell rang, it was like, oh my gosh, okay, everything's okay. Just go to the door. You're going to be fine. And it would take me back like, okay, this, 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 this. And I, and I was clear back to he died. I'm a loser. I'm worthless. And it, that's just how it works. When you've gone through those things, you guys know what I'm talking about. Something happens. My kid walks in and tells me I'm worthless about something. And I'm triggered by those words, right? And I don't get sad or humiliated or broken. I get mad. We get mad at people in those moments because fear wants to protect itself by showing power, right? We don't have to use that anymore. Just think it, like, as soon as I get triggered nowadays, I literally visualize, okay, I'm gonna be connected to my Heavenly Father, I'm going to be connected to my purpose and my mission here on Earth, and I want Christ at the center of all of that. He's at the center of my life. And with those connections, I can overcome those triggers. If there's a movie and all of a sudden there's a gun, that used to be huge for me. I would go running out the door, like fight or flight, talk about it. I would literally start jog, running out the door, uh, couldn't breathe. And those panic attacks are so real. But the tools that have worked for me, and I hope that they help somebody out there, write those lists of first figuring out what your triggers are. What are, what are the triggers that happen for you? Mine is I'm alone or I'm worthless. Somebody does something that makes me feel that way. Maybe for you, it's somebody cuts you off in traffic and all of a sudden you're like, they don't give a crap about me. I'm pissed off and you want to rage them off the road. Whatever your triggers are to whatever fears, there's that list I want you to make and figure out which ones you are, are succeeding with and which ones you are not succeeding with. But also just those visualizations of, you know what? I have purpose. I am beautiful. I am strong. Whatever your reassuring words are, get those connections this way, not this way. As soon as someone pulls me this way, I'm pissed off or whatever it is, okay? So those are my challenges for you. You guys, this was a unique conference for me. I want to sit here and talk to you forever, but I also really want to um, leave time because I know everybody's time is limited. I want to leave time for all these amazing women that you're going to hear from next. And before I end, um, I have many other YouTube videos that tell my story and my story has been on Dateline and a billion other murder mysteries. If you want to know facts, if you want to know my, um, pretty much my journal through all of it, I have a book on, on Amazon. Um, it's called the moments we stand silence breaks and you can find out tons of information about me and these other women. Um, but I want you guys to know something about you. I want you to know, this is what I tell my little baby. 
I'm, I remarried again, by the way. That's the boy's the last name. And I never did think I was going to be a woman that got married three times. That's, that's a story for another day. And my husband now is a saint. He is literally the most steady person I know. If I think he's going to get all excited about something, it's like, oh, that's amazing. Like, this is him golfing. You would never know if he got a hole in one or if he threw it, like if he hit it in the water because everything is just, oh, okay, well, that's done. He's pretty much my favorite person I've ever met in my entire life. Anyways, we have a little baby. She's not here. I kind of want to show it to you guys. We have a little baby named Kennedy. And um, every night, she uh, she was another do-over for me. She was born 11 months ago this week. Actually, today, you guys are going to be listening to this on the 24th. In one month, it's her birthday. But she was another do-over for me. I had so much PTSD and trauma that came out because the last time I had a baby was right before Emmett died. And every... Every time something happened in my pregnancy, I went through all the emotions again, but it almost like cleansed it out. When she turned seven weeks, I had a major panic attack and um, just got to, got to do a different kind of do-over. Anyway, every night when I tuck her in bed, I tell her truths that I know about her. And this is something you guys could do for yourself or your children or your spouse. I tell her about 30 things that I know are true. I know, and I want you guys to know that these are true about you too. You're going to have individual ones that will be more than this, but I know that you are a child of God. I know that he loves you. I know that you are brave because these stories you've lived are freaking hard and you have done it. And maybe some days you feel like you haven't done it perfectly. Thank goodness. We're not here to do things perfectly. We're here to do things by learning and messing up and fixing it and struggling and succeeding. We're here to do all that. I know that you are enough. You're enough for Heavenly Father. You are enough for yourself. I know that you are kind. And I know that you aren't always kind. But I know that when you aren't kind, you know how to make it right. I know that you are so, so courageous to show up, to wake up, to get out of bed. And some days that might be the most courage you have. And I am so proud of you for that. I know that you are loving, that you do loving things. I know that you are loved. Whether you see it or not, whether the people who actually love you show you or not, you are loved. I know that you can do great things. I know that this world is a dark place, but I promise you there are glimmers of light. There are glimmers of hope, and I promise you that you can be one of those. I always have to tell, I, I just keep going. I keep saying I'm going to end, but I just keep going. I always have to tell this story because it was my moment. I had millions of moments. You can read about them in my book or watch them on some of my YouTube channel. But I had millions of moments that pulled me out of the fog. And that's what we're in most of the time. We're not always on our game and we're not always super struggling, but a lot of times we're like in a fog. And that's where I found myself a lot. But I had it this day after the murder trial. I had this day, it was a few days after, but I got my kids off to school. I had the two little kids. I literally pulled into the stall of a grocery store and sat in the stall feeling so broken. And I thought for sure that the trial was going to be like the pinnacle of my healing. And so I sat in the stall and I was like, Here's the thing, Heavenly Father, I am so broken. Like I, I really thought that the murder trial, after hearing everything and seeing the markers where his body was, seeing everything, I thought I was gonna feel so whole and I feel worse. Like there was a whole room full of people who were hurting and I literally thought I was the only person in the whole world who was hurting. So what now? What do I do now? Everything is not what it seemed. I thought literally everyone had forgotten about this whole thing. And then we sit through this trial and all these people are staring at me. And I'm in a fishbowl all the time and I don't know what to do and I can't breathe. So what? What now? And I, I pity partied, threw balloons up, everything. I sat in my car waiting for Heavenly Father to give me some grand piece of light that could carry me through to whatever the crap he wanted me to do next. And I sat in my car waiting and it was just silent. I'm like, please send me somebody. Send me anybody. 
nothing. I always say, and this cute little old lady knocked on my window and rolled it down and she fixed everything. It, it's not true. I'm going to just skip over that part. So I got in the grocery store. I was pushing my cart. We were dropping Cheetos in behind us in case we lost our way and we couldn't find our way out of the store. And these two little kids just stared at me like I knew anything or how to raise them or do anything for them. And I felt so broken. And I walked to the back of the store and I was throwing things in my cart. And all of a sudden I saw this lady and I'm not kidding. The second I saw her, I was like, that lady needs you to stop and help her. And I was like, no, she doesn't. She's fully clothed. She's got her act together. You're the one that's a hot mess. No, you're not going to go help that lady. This is ridiculous. And I just kept, I got to show you, I just kept pushing my cart. <laughs> I'm so sorry about the hands. Um, and so I passed her again and I'm like, no, I'm not helping her. I'm not helping her. Look at her. She's going to think that I think she's a beggar and she's not. She clearly has things going on. And so I get to the back of the other part of the store and I keep feeling this nudge, this pull to go and help her. And so eventually, uh, Heavenly Father and I had this battle and I ended up reaching into this side, wall, pop, the side pocket of my wallet and found a hundred dollar bill. And I was like, I don't even know where this came from. I literally, okay, so you want me to give her money? I, that's clear. And I started walking towards her and I was shaking like I often did. And I reached out to her and tapped her on her shoulder and I'm like, oh, hello. Um, so I don't know you, but I have been wandering the store feeling like I was supposed to stop and help you. And I just, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna give you this money. And she looked up at me, you guys, she was in the fog. The one that I had lived in for so long that I thought I was the only person who lived in it. She looked up at me from that fog and I could see it in her eyes. I could see this pain in her soul. And she looked up at me and she's like, wait, what, what did you say? Kind of like when I was at the grocery store, I literally couldn't even connect with this person that was trying to talk to me at one. She looked up at me like that. And I was like, um, so I, I just, I feel like I'm supposed to give you this money. And she was like, but how did, how did you know? I have like $13 in my bank account and all these groceries I need to get for my children. How, but how would you know that? And I just stared into her eyes and I saw me. I saw the broken girl I've been praying for that needed help. And I was like, you know, I um, I have no idea. I just, you know what? You have a heavenly father and he loves you. And right now he wanted you to know that you are enough and you are loved. And she gave me a big hug and I hugged onto her so tight. It was like the first time I saw that broken fear in somebody else and I let her go and we said goodbye and she walked away and that time I had a bounce much different than the bounce that the boy told me that I was cute and I felt better about myself I had this bounce and this purpose like I had heard God and he had told me right now I need you and I walked around saying, I'm not worthy. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing left to give. And he said, yes, you do. And I need you to do it right now. And for that moment, I got to be his hands. And I got to lift somebody else out of their own pit. And, and since that moment, I have never been the same. I literally thought healing was going to come from other people coming and pulling me out of the pit over and over and I just kept falling back in it and they'd pull me out and they'd come and do my dishes and they would come and take my kids places and they just kept pulling me out and I was still stuck in it, feeling alone and afraid. And in that moment, I realized the only way out of the pit is to see others in the pit and to go, hey, look. I know how you're feeling. Let's get out of this pit together and climb out of that pit and show them how to do it. And, um, and that's, that is my mission and my purpose. And in that shell, I have just felt so strong that I don't want people to feel like I felt. I don't want people to feel alone and broken and afraid. I first started out like sharing my journey, standing on stages because I thought, you know what? If I could save one freaking man from going and doing stupid crap and getting shot in the face, then it is worth it. The, the, the wife at home that's alone and afraid and has the kids upstairs and she doesn't know what to say to him, I could save that whole situation. And I have had people be saved from that. I've had emails from so many people like, 
I was in that moment. I had the gun and I was waiting outside the door. And then I saw your face from Dateline. And I remember you saying, put your family first. And I did. I put the gun away and I walked into the house like a brave person instead of a coward. And I used my words because of you. And those moments have happened. And that's what I thought the mission and purpose was. But more than even that, we're all going to make mistakes. We are all going to make mistakes. We are all going to do things wrong. Parenting, whatever it is you're doing wrong, you're not alone in that. But you're also not alone in the fight to find our worth. To find that we are worth so much more than all those other people have showed us we are. The fight to know that the the battles that we face are not against each other. They're against that darkness of the world. The adversary who wants us to feel alone and afraid and worthless. But to also help people remember that they have truths. That they have a savior who believes in them. Who trusts them. Who believes that they can accomplish who believes that they will get through their struggles and survive. And I pray that this conference is that for you guys, that you find your truths, that you connect to your creator and that you find your mission and purpose. You are here for a reason right now with the body that you have and the mind that you have and and the family that you have and everything you've been given for a reason. And I know you can accomplish in this life. And I know that you can find your worth. And if that's not your struggle, whatever your struggle is, I know that with the Savior, we can get through anything, including this pandemic, including all of our struggles, including bad relationships. There is hope and there is a glimmer of light.